Thank you, Dr. Mellinger. Thank you, Dr. Marks. It's an honor to be on this panel, and we're all honored and indebted to Jeff Ponsky, who has certainly have, ha has had a significant impact on my career. I have no disclosures. Uh, buried bumper will be discussed by Bipan Chan after me, but it's important to note this complication because what we do early on, as John and Jeff have, has shown, has an impact on early complications as well as late complications. <laughs> this is a representation of one of my first cases at Kings County where I actually went through the left lobe of the liver. Didn't know about it, oftentimes you may not. It's a very low complication, but the surgeons had to go in, trauma surgeons had to go in for a different reason and found the tube going through the liver. So that's certainly one of the early complications of peg placement. As Jeff and John has shown, the uh, transillumination is critical for this procedure, as is the digital one-to-one, -one, which I call the Pillsbury dose sign. There was an old commercial. You can Google it on YouTube and see this little fat Pillsbury doughboy being pushed in the stomach. And I tell my residents this is the kind of representation of that indentation. We have advantages as surgeons. Uh, this society has been tremendously uh, giving to me. I hope I have given back as much. And I think the heritage of surgeons, we have the opportunity to work collegially with our colleagues in GI, and there will be cases that they can't do, that they won't be able to transilluminate, or they won't be able to do it technically, and you should accept those cases graciously, uh, and, and, and don't tell them afterwards that you did it and they couldn't do it, because you'll get more cases if you're gracious. Uh, at Northwell, where I worked before my present job, we worked with the GI people. They wanted us to actually do the, the percutaneous Seldinger type. And then you got to develop a relationship with them, and then they would refer you the difficult PEG cases. I think the advantages for us is that we have the operating room. Uh, most of us do our PEGs in an endoscopy suite, but there is an advantage to the OR. Uh, one of them is many times the OR could be darker than your endoscopy suite, but I think more importantly, we have the ability to place the OR table in deep uh, reverse Trendelenburg, which for those difficult to do pegs where you can't transilluminate, this can be an invaluable uh, technique for your procedure. <clears throat> uh, there's another prominent surgeon, Todd Ponsky, who's a pediatric surgeon, and Todd graciously shared with me his insights. I called him before this talk because I wanted to um, get an insight of what pediatric surgeons do. And Todd uh, actually forwarded me an email of a video of a SAGE's JPEG meeting where Todd and his dad, Jeff Ponsky, had a repartee going back and forth about which technique is better. And obviously, uh, Dr. Santos would be interested in this, but Todd really pushed the STAM technique, laparoscopic STAM technique, because the pediatric population, he explained to me, is different. There's a risk of colon injury. Uh, these patients oftentimes need foregut surgery in the future and a long jeep tube can be pulled out by a patient, uh, an infant or a child that's probably less cooperative than an adult. But Ponsky Sr. had the last word, and uh, as, I guess I have to go back a little bit here. Let's go back here. Thanks. Uh, I, I think it's amazing. I watched this uh, video and heard Jeff's talk yesterday, and Jeff had a patient with carcinomatosis, patient who had a short uh, longevity and frozen abdomen and was able to get in between the two lower ribs and get a peg tube to help this patient so that there was some palliation for this patient not to be vomiting before they died. Dr. Ponsky also had done in a, in a different patient a double peg technique in a cardiac cripple who needed a paraesophageal hernia repair. So after I saw this, I said, you know, I'm convinced that what we do here endoscopically is still the way to go. Early complications are procedure-related uh, with the patient, technical, and post-procedure. And I think we uh, have to select these patients, as uh, uh, you know, the speakers have mentioned here, as John Mellinger really emphasized. And there are going to be some patients that we really sh shouldn't be doing this procedure on. But we need to have a protocol, and we need to approach these patients like we're doing major intestinal surgery. Many of our patients nowadays are on Plavix and aspirin, and you should have the same protocol for the PEG patient uh, for these patients that you would for doing a colon resection. Uh, I think it's important to do the complete endoscopy first before you do the PEG. Early in my career, I did the uh, PEG and then I did the endoscopy, and what happens is I think it contributes to a higher rate of post-procedure pneumoperitoneum. 
And I think that's certainly one of the things we need to avoid because there will be a small percentage of cases where you're going to have to really uh, examine the patient and, and determine whether or not the pneumoperitoneum is clinically significant. The other speakers have really uh, emphasized the technical points. So the other things I like to say is that we use the abdominal binder very liberally. Uh, we feel that these patients many times are neurologically impacted and they're going to be pulling at the tubes. Also at times I'll cut the tube short. Uh, it's less of a target for the patient to pull. And uh, as Dr. Ponsky has shown, that little button, gastrostomy, but I think we're more likely to use the button. Uh, BPON will talk about that later when there's a mature tract. Absolute contraindications are, are few. Uh, certainly, uh, somebody with malignant ascites is not a contraindication or abdominal scars. Aspiration seems to be uh, involved in a perioperative, the, oper the procedure related, and post procedure. I think it's important to avoid excessive sedation and have a good anesthesia team. We recently had a patient come down to the endoscopy suite who was over sedated. He had received dilaudid on the floor. And we, I sent the patient back up to the floor. We said, we're not going to do this today. And we did it the following day. So be careful of over sedation when you do these patients. In the old days, we were all credentialed to do Demerol and Versed and Valium. The surgeons would do that. We didn't have anesthesia in the room. And I think we actually administered anesthesia safely. And we were less likely to give an overdose. But if you have a good anesthesia team, this should not be a problem. <clears throat> the uh, post-operative. Uh, uh, aspiration uh, has a lot to do with nursing care, but you need to communicate to nursing. There appears to be no difference between bolus and tube feeds. My outpatients are mostly bolus feeds, but you should have the same precautions that you would 60 degree head of bed elevation, and the patients have to be assessed regularly by the nursing staff. There is a recent study showing that semi-solid food through peg tube may be less uh, associated with post-procedure aspiration. This you should avoid, gastric varics. Uh, it probably would not look very good to put a gastric uh, tube through this or do a biopsy of this. So be vigilant with your patients with hepatic uh, encephalopathy or liver changes where they have varices. And invariably, if they have esophageal varices, they're going to have gastric varices. <clears throat> Some of the pitfalls, as uh, John uh, pointed out very clearly, don't make the incision too tight or too loose because you may have leakage around it. And in most cases, it's very important for you to document the number on the tube uh, relative to the outer flange because you don't want the nurses pulling it away or pushing it away. So that number, usually two or three, you really have to be vigilant about that in the post-procedure period. Early tube dislodgement occurs in up to 4% of cases. And what we describe as early dislodgement is within the first 14 days. For a mature colocutaneous tract to develop takes from zero to 14 days, and it may be a little bit longer in your immunocompromised patients or malnourished patients. But that's generally the time before a mature tract will develop. Inadvertent removal is a big problem. If the tract is developed, then you can put a replacement tomb easily. But you can't do that in an early post-op. This is a uh, picture of a tube that's partially withdrawn. So the only way they found out about this, it's pulled out of the stomach, is they did a laparotomy. But we'll see that it's not necessary to do a laparotomy in the few cases you have to go back on. I think the role of the CT scan is limited because it's going to see pneumoperitoneum, and that's not going to tell you anything, as pneumoperitoneum can occur in up to 40% of patients. But it may demonstrate that previous case where there, there's separation of the internal bumper from the gastric lumen. This was a nice study uh, done showing how insignificant pneumoperitoneum is. Actually, only 1.8% developed peritonitis of the patients who had a peg tube placed, who had abdominal air. This was a nice study by Bruce Shermer's group at the University of Virginia. And his rate is consistent with uh, the rest of the literature, about 4% for early dislodgement. But Bruce looked at long term, so we have to really be vigilant about that when the patients leave the hospital or go to the nursing home. And he showed that there was a high rate, up to 15% of dislodgement. This is a uh, gastrographin study. I don't do those. If the tubes are dislodged, I'll explain why. 
this is generally the, the, the algorithm that in the early post-op period, you can generally manage early, early post-procedure period, you can manage these patients without going to the operating room. Uh, this was uh, six patients actually, and you can see that two were able to get a new PEG tube and one had a laparoscopic gastrostomy. So the algorithm we generally use uh, is basically keep the patient NPO, IV antibiotics, serial physical exam, and then get back to the endoscopy suite to replace the tube. Now, as was pointed out, the pliability of these new tubes is, uh, newer tubes is a problem. When Dr. Ponsky first described the technique, uh, we were in New York, we, we used his technique and we had that Bunsen burner rubber and we were using the Medicuts, I remember this early on, and those tubes would not dislodge. The patients could not pull them out of the abdomen. So we've advanced in our technology, but we've actually gone backwards because the, the dislodgement rate is higher. And this was Dr. Ponsky's original tube, but you don't see the internal bumper, which really pre prevented it from being pulled out of the gastric lumen. One of my uh, good friends, military surgeon, Dr. Shavanis at uh, Cooper, told me they had a rash of these um, tubes being pulled out by their patients at Cooper. So they went to a new protocol. They got very selective in who the patients they were going to put this in. And he, developed, he went to a new type of PEG tube that actually is constantly inflated. And uh, he said that their rate of, um, it's like a balloon type PEG tube, their rate of inadvertent removal decreased after that. So we have to be vigilant and set up our own protocols with nursing and, and, and the physicians taking care of the patient. Again, reemphasize liberal use of abdominal binder. It, it, it prevents the patient from having a target to get to. And we usually turn that around so that the Velcro is actually in the back, so then they really have to pull and they can't just release the Velcro. So the question to the audience uh, is if you get a 2 a.m. phone call, and the, this is in the early period again within the first seven days or so, and the nurse tells you that the feeds won't go in, uh, then what do you do? Uh, and then I think what most of us would do, I mean, there may be a few of you who would go in and endoscope the patient at 2 a.m. I, I don't think you need to necessarily do that. Keep the patient MPO, IV antibiotics, follow the physical exam. If the patient does develop peritonitis, then you can go to the operating room laparoscopically. If not, then we take the patient back to the endoscopy suite. I don't wait seven days. We'll go back the next day. Uh, also, if the, if the tube is pulled out, we have a similar protocol. And many times you can go through, you can see the stigmata of where the tube was and go through the exact same site on the abdominal wall. Similar scenario here. Again, I think we should use our skill set and our heritage and use our endoscopic skills unless the patient has peritoneal signs. Necrotizing fasciitis was alluded to. It's not common in the literature, but it does have to be addressed. You have to keep an eye on that wound and make sure that the patient does not develop a progressive abdominal wall infection. Hemorrhage, uh, not a common problem, but avoid the gastric vessels. And if you do have a gastric bleeder, pull the uh, inner bumper against the outer bumper for pressure, but don't leave the endoscopy suite before you release that and see that the bleeding has stopped. Because if you leave it too tight, you will get a migration of the internal bumper. This is rare complication, but nevertheless, it is something we have to consider. And I just want to say that um, Dr. Ponsky, Dr. Marks, Dr. Mellinger, although Dr. Mellinger is now in Illinois, have established Cleveland as the mecca and epicenter of endoscopy and gastrointestinal surgery. But their football team is horrible. They, were one, they won one game last year. Um, they have the distinction of firing the Hall of Fame, probably the best coach in the history of the NFL, Bill Belichick, who is now up in New England and has won six Super Bowls. Cleveland Browns fired them. So this is what I propose. That the owner, Jimmy Haslam, immediately appoint uh, Jeff Ponsky as the vice president of football operations. And as his assistant as general manager, he get Jeff Marks. We can't include Mellinger because he's in Illinois and has his own problems with the Chicago Bears. But I thank you very much.